good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. And here, Chelsea Cook is going to talk to us about ther thermal regulation of your bees, uh, which sounds very interesting. So I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I'll hand it over to you, Chelsea. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Brennan. I really appreciate the invitation to uh, to speak today to everybody. Thank you all so much for coming, um, especially it sounds like there's lots of people from lots of different time zones. So uh, really exciting. And um, uh, thanks again for taking whatever part of your day you're taking out to be here. Um, so yeah, so I am, I just started as an assistant professor at Marquette University. So I'm in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, close to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, so I'm getting my research lab started there, um, albeit strangely and slowly, given in the current circumstances. Um, and uh, in addition to being a, uh, an assistant professor, I'm also a chief science officer at Hive Tech Solutions. So um, it's, that is my startup company that I will um, give you a little bit of information of what we are uh, all about uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, and I, I'm really excited to give this talk, um, especially too, because uh, if some of you have seen um, uh, if you saw Celia Davis's talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, a lot of um, what she talked about, kind of the physiology and importance of understanding uh, the difference between summer and winter bees, I'll, I'll talk about that and um, that should be good information. And if you haven't seen that, it's on the YouTube channel. Um, so definitely check that out. It was lots of wonderful information from Celia's talk. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time. So let's jump into it. So. Um, Today I'm going to focus on uh, how some of my research and some of the work that I've done uh, with my startup company has worked to understand thermoregulation in honeybee colonies and how we can use that knowledge and information to keep better bees. So um, before I get too far into this, I just want to take a moment to thank um, the students and the mentors and the funding sources that um, I've been lucky enough to engage with um, over the last couple of years to do this work. So a lot of this work um, will uh, is a part of um, my postdoc, or sorry, my PhD rather, and um, some of the work is also part of um, my company, as I mentioned. So um, these people, Mike Breed and Brian Smith, are two amazing advisors of mine. My, Mike is my PhD advisor, and then Rachel, Liam, Sharif, and Kelsey are were undergraduate researchers um, who helped collect a lot of this data, so I'll cite them throughout as well. And I do want to also thank um, the USDA, who I did not post here, the US Department of, of Agriculture, um, who funded some of this research as well. So we all know, you know, honeybees are incredible, incredibly important as far as pollination goes. They're um, the, the pollination services that they provide here in the United States. Um, Adds, adds up to billions of dollars in agricultural funds um, in terms of what we grow, what we export, what we use um, here as far as agriculture goes. So um, there's really no doubt that honeybees are important. Um, and the one of the questions that I have just kind of as a researcher and as um, someone who's you know, interested in, in biology and interested in our natural world is why are bees so good at what they do? Why are they so good at, the, at pollinating these varieties of, um, of plants and flowers and, um, uh, you know, the different morphologies, the different colors, the different odors that are associated with um, the flowers that, um, that end up being a lot of the food that we eat? Um, and so really one of the questions that really drive that work, why are they so important agriculturally um, and why are they so critical for pollination, um, I come to the conclusion that uh, honeybees, they're social, they have this incredible ability to organize, so they're constantly communicating, constantly working together to evaluate their environment and organize to buffer their environment or uh, adapt to different changes in their environment. Um, so as, as, as I just said, so they, they have this incredible ability to organize. Um, and that includes being able to sense their environment. They communicate this information. So one of the ways that we know that's you know, more obvious is the waggle dance, right? So bees communicate where they find food and the quality of that food through a literal dance language behavior. Um, so they're really incredible at communicating information, but I have some work and some other um, uh, colleagues have done some work that 
uh, shows that even subtle communication, like through trophallaxis or through vibrations, um, I'm sure uh, if anyone saw Tom Seeley's talk, I'm sure he talked about that or knows Tom Seeley's work. Um, they can communicate through vibration. Um, really, really incredible, fascinating ways that they communicate. And then they use, they sense the environment, they communicate that information that they've received from the environment, and they organize to affect change. So they organize, they, they independently, you know, sense all this information, but then they come together and the changes and the behaviors that they engage in um, affect the environment so they can um you know they they can forage uh it for you know dozens of of uh, miles in radius sorry i know i'm from the us so i'm using miles but kilometers um <laughs> in radius uh from their hive um they can thermoregulate they can heat they can cool um, they uh, know who, who, the number of bees that need to be foraging they know the number of bees that need to be nursing so they're they're independently kind of um, working together to affect this change. Um, so really, I think the their ability to organize, to pollinate, to be this absolute force of, of nature and, and workhorse of agriculture, um, really, I think this ability to organize is, the, is what they're doing. So thinking about that organization and thinking about what happens in the honeybee colony. Um, I know a lot of you probably already know this, but it doesn't hurt to ever, to, it doesn't ever hurt to have a little bit of a refresher. So um, in the summertime, honeybees, honeybee workers um, divide themselves across uh, jobs according to their age. So the youngest bees are nurse bees. So they're the ones who are sticking their heads into the cells, um, uh, cleaning them, cleaning the cells out after bees emerge. They're feeding larvae, they're um, discarding larvae if they're um, infected with any diseases, um, and they're performing kind of a lot of the in-colony tasks. And then those bees, after about 10 days, move on to uh, peripheral hive jobs like guarding, fanning, or undertaking. So guard bees are kind of the bouncers of the colonies, right? So they're the security guards who are making sure that anybody who comes in uh, belongs there. Uh, fanners are uh, bees that fan, literally fan and help them regulate the colony. So I'll talk about them extensively. And um, undertakers are the bees that are removing any dead bees from inside the colony. And then all worker honeybees uh, end their life as a forager. So there, there's even more fascinating division of labor here in the forager task group. So some bees will collect pollen, some bees will collect nectar, some bees collect water, some bees collect all of them, right? So there, it's even more complex as you drill deeper into um, some of these tasks. So this is a typical summer bee, right? So thinking about what Celia told us a couple of weeks ago, um, thinking about, uh, you know, the jobs that they do over their time, uh, over their lifetime, this is what we see in the summer. Um, and what really fascinated me is uh, this fanner group, this thermoregulation. So fanners are these conspicuous bees that sit on the outside of their colony. Um, and I really wanted to dive into what really drives the um, the thermoregulation and that organization at the in this middle age task group. Um, so what are these bees doing to um, affect the change in their climate uh, in their uh, colony? And so uh, a lot of my work, uh, so a lot of my work has focused on this the last couple of years. So the overall outline for my talk today will be how do honeybees thermoregulate when it's hot? Um, and speaking, you know, thinking about the behaviors that they do when it's hot, um, how is that thermoregulatory fanning behavior um, organized? So I'll talk about the social aspects of that and some of the information that they may be using. Um, we we also I'm also fascinated by what honeybees do when it's cold. So how do they thermoregulate? What are the behaviors that they're doing when it's cold? And then how can we kind of uh, use all of this information um, to understand uh, how to keep better bees and to essentially like hijack this thermoregulatory information to keep better bees. So first I'll focus on how do bees thermoregulate when it's hot? So what are the behaviors that they're doing? And how is, the, how is that fanning behavior in particular organized? So when I say fanning behavior, um, I mean this behavior here. So this is uh, entrance of the colony. 
Um, this is a group of fanning bees that their heads are facing into the colony. So this is the entrance of the colony. Their abdomens are facing out and they're fanning their wings. So you can't really see their wings. They're gripping onto the surface of the porch, we, you know, the porch of the colony and um, fanning their wings. And this helps to circulate the hot air out and allow cool air to go in through the uh, center, ten tends to be the center of that porch area of the entrance area. Um, and when I first started my PhD, I was absolutely blown away by this behavior. How is this behavior organized? What, how do they know what's happening, right? Like what is, what, what is happening here? Um, so clearly not all bees are fanning, not all bees are queuing into whatever it, uh, thing is happening, whatever sensation that is occurring to um, elicit this behavior from these specific bees. So I really wanted to know what was going on here. Um, and thinking about this ecologically, why is this important? Um, so a couple of years ago, this, this um, article, I believe, was from uh, 2015, um, that there was a drought in Australia affecting um, honey supplies. Um, and it was because, uh, you know, I highlighted this um, the sentence here that, or these couple of sentences here, that the high temperatures in Australia have caused stress and erratic behavior in local bee populations, and in extreme cases have caused beeswax and honeycombs to melt inside the hive. The bees are then forced to remain inside and collectively fan their wings in an attempt to cool the hive, leaving them with no time to collect nectar. So there's this very intricate interaction that's happening between uh, the, the time balance and the energy balance that the entire colony devotes to cooling the colony versus collecting nectar. Um, and it, when you throw a drought into it, when there's a lack of water, bees can then also not um, collect enough uh, water to bring to the colony and do the evaporative cooling. So so I know Ireland is very lucky in, in uh, that sense that, uh, you know, not very many droughts occur. Um, but this is just something, again, just highlighting this delicate balance of how the environment affects um, the entire division of labor inside the colony and why it's important to understand uh, the, those complex interactions. So um, overarching question again, how is this fanning behavior organized? So what is going on um, in these bees that do fan that uh, cause them to fan? And so um, to break this question down even further, um, the questions that I was exploring during my PhD is what makes fanning behavior happen? Um, do bees respond differently in quickly changing environments? And does the presence of larvae affect fanning behavior? So to, to just try to, you know, encompass what is actually driving this behavior behavior to, to occur. Um, so this is my humble um, research location in Boulder, Colorado. So this is the apiary that I um, uh, kept and did all my research in. So I was doing all the beekeeping, doing all the research. Um, a lot of us probably have similar colonies where you just have a rock sitting on top of your, uh, your colony to make sure that lid doesn't fly away. So so funny. Uh, every even I've I, you know mentioned to Brendan I've been to a couple of different countries and done some beekeeping and some uh, some work in Turkey and Chile and a couple of different places and this is one of those ubiquitous things that <laughs> beekeepers use is rocks on top of the colony. So I always think it's funny. Um, so yeah, so this is my colonies, my uh, my apiary. So I'd go out and I would find colonies where bees were fanning and then I would collect fanning bees and bring them into the lab and place them into a jar on a hot plate. So this is my heating apparatus. And this is essentially just like poor grad student needs to do research and how do we do this? So um, I constructed this heating apparatus uh, with a, a, a high accuracy temperature probe um, and a jar sitting on top of a hot plate. The bees were propped up so they weren't touching the sides or the bottom of the jar and I had a little fan circulating air. Um, so I was able to use the hot plate to heat the air inside the jar and uh, evaluate the fanning response. So um, uh, we would keep track of the how many bees would fan and the temperature at which bees would fan. Um, so thinking about the uh, response threshold here. So uh, 
Oh, so I, I was kind of uh, diving into this already. So I'd collect bees um, from different caste groups. So I would collect nurses, guards, fanners, and foragers. Um, I think today I'm going to focus on just the fanning, uh, the fanner task group. I might, I, I can't remember if I show the task, the other um, task group, so that's okay. So I would place them into this mesh, mesh cage and I'd either place them by themselves in small groups of three or in larger groups of 10. And you saw at the, uh, in the video that there, um, 10 is kind of this number that um, when I was just watching this behavior happen at the colony, 10 seemed to be a good median number of bees that, um, uh, I saw at the entrance of the colony. So kind of the typical number of bees. Um, and then I heated them for one degree per minute, one degree Celsius per minute, um, which is somewhat fast, but I had some temperature probes at the entrance at the, on the porch of the colony. And um, in these little micro environments that is actually um, tends to be a pretty normal and average uh, rate of temperature change. So um, uh, really, you know, again, thinking about these little microclimates that the bees exist in. So then I'm going to show you these results. So um, across the x-axis is group size. So this, I'm going to show you the um, probability of fanning. So this is um, the likelihood that uh, the bees are going to begin to fan uh, when they're by themselves, when they're, when they're in groups of three, and when they're in groups of 10. And what I found was that when bees were by themselves, they actually rarely fanned. So when I first started doing this experiment, um, the uh, single bees that I would bring in and heat up, they would almost never fan. And I was so disappointed as a you know first year PhD student trying to get these experiments to work. I'm like, oh, this, ex this setup's not working. This is so stupid. Um, but then I was like, let me put one other bee in. And I heated them up and sure enough, um, they begin to fan. So I, I you know, in groups of three, um, they're significantly more likely to fan um, when uh, in, in the small group. And then when they're in groups of 10, they're even more likely to fan. Um, so really exciting um, to see that the social aspect of the fanning response, uh, the, the social aspect of their environment actually helps to elicit the fanning response. So um, and that, I think that makes a lot of sense because if you're by yourself, if you're going to do a behavior that's going to heat yourself up, why, why waste your time? Um, but if there's another individual around, then it makes more sense that you um, may want to fan. Um, we also kept track, of, kept track of the temperature that they fanned at. So again, when they were by themselves, um, they fanned at really high temperatures. So not really uh, affecting any uh, change or any buffering in the colony um, at that oh, when they're by themselves at those high temperatures. Um, when they're in groups of three, it's a little bit better, a little bit lower, but still on the higher side, uh, especially because, um, oh, so I, sorry, I forgot to mention this. If the, if the temperatures inside the colony um, get above about 36, 37 degrees Celsius, then the um, developing larvae inside can develop malformations and die. Um, so it's really critical that the colony keep the that the um, colony uh, remains um, around 36 uh, degrees Celsius so um, uh, that that's this um, orange line that goes across I think I put it at 37 36.5 I think is the um, ideal colony temperature or what we most often find so in groups of three, they're getting a little bit better, getting a little bit closer to that colony temperature. And then in groups of 10, um, they're really close. They're on average, they're fanning um, uh, very close to that ideal colony temperature. So again, I think what this is telling us here is that um, bees in, when they're in groups, they're better at sensing the environment. They're better potentially at uh, communicating about the, what they're sensing from their environment, and they're better able to affect change or uh, at least organize to affect change. When you have evil scientists controlling the temperature in there, they're not affecting any change because I'm turning it up as they're starting to fan, but at least we know that the response, what's happening as far as their behavioral response. Um, oh, and I do, uh, I am going to show a little bit about the ta different task groups because I think this is really cool. So across nurses, guards, fanners, and foragers, um, I'm going to show you a probability of fanning in each of these task groups. And I find that nurse bees are, oh, and this is groups of 10, so 10 nurses, um, that uh, nurses are somewhat likely to begin to fan guards uh, about the same. Um, fanners are the most likely to begin to fan. So there's, again, maybe something um, 
in particular about these bees because guards and fanners tend to be around the same age. So there's something about these bees that make them more likely to perform this task. And then foragers were the lead, and I, I focused on pollen foragers because they were easy to identify when they were coming back to the colony. Uh, so pollen foragers seem to be the least likely um, bees who are going to begin to fan. So again, this is all across uh, groups of 10. So we do see um, sig some significant differences here um, in fanning. So what, what makes fanning happen? So honeybees are more likely to fan in groups and they fan at lower response thresholds when they're in those groups. So um, I think this really just tells us that there's a big social component uh, to the fanning response. So they need to be in groups to be able to understand, yep, this is what I need to do and maybe just communicate or uh, sense their environment effectively. And bees also vary in the probability of fanning through their task groups, through their jobs. So um, next thinking about how are bees actually responding differently uh, to their environment. So again, we have these different situations where some days um, uh, the, the environment changes quickly. So I know, uh, so I did this work, a lot of this work in Colorado and in Colorado, uh, sometimes the, I would wake up and it would be 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I know I'm not good at Celsius, even though I'm a scientist, I should be better. Um, we would wake up at, uh, and it would be 60 degrees in the morning and then it'd be 90 degrees by midday. So just some really dramatic temperature changes uh, in Colorado. So just trying to, to understand how bees would potentially respond uh, to more slowly versus more quickly changing environments. And again, that's our environment. That's not these microclimates that, that these bees are um, living in. So um, bees are more likely to fan if temperatures are increasing um, oop, uh, increasing quickly, but only in groups of 10. And I'm sorry, am I giving you, I'm giving you the results way too early. Sorry about that. Um, so to do this behavioral experiment, to understand how bees are um, uh, responding to their environment, I collected bees from the hives um, just as I had before, but this time I'm just focusing on fanners. I didn't do the, all the task groups. And I placed them in their different group sizes. So by themselves in groups of three and in groups of 10. And then I heated them at different rates. I heated them at a slow rate, which was about half a degree per minute, one degree per minute, which was the same uh, uh, heating rate that I gave them, um, that I put them uh, through in, for my previous experiment. And then two degrees per minute, which is really fast. But again, thinking about um, the data we collected at the entrance of the colony and inside the uh, in the periphery of the colony two degrees per minute was something that we actually saw it's on the extreme side um, but we did see uh, in these micro uh, climates the temperature changed that quickly so here I'm going to show you um, I'm just going to focus on um, groups of 10 and how quickly um, the bees uh, how, how the, the probability of fanning across the um, the different uh, heating rates, the slow, the medium, and the fast rate. So in groups of 10, bees um, are less likely to begin to fan um, when they're being heated slowly. Uh, when they're being heated at a medium rate, um, they're a little bit more likely to fan. Um, but when they, um, and, and that wasn't significantly different between half a degree per minute, one degree per minute, but when you're heating them fast, the bees are almost all of them fan almost every single time. So we see this really dramatic increase of probability of fanning that occurs um, when they're being heated uh, more quickly. So uh, really robust response in these groups of 10. And then, um, looking at the threshold, so the temperature that they're actually beginning to fan at. Um, again, I'm, this is just groups of 10. So at the slow rate, um, you know, they're pretty good. They're groups of 10, even being heated slowly, are still pretty good at fanning around the ideal thermal thresholds. Um, no significant difference uh, between those different, those temperatures um, for the heating rate, for uh, a me the medium uh, heating rate. Um, but then when we heat them at a fast rate again, um, that they are responding way sooner and fanning at way earlier temperatures compared to um, when they are being heated at a medium or a slow rate. 
So bees are responding differently in quickly changing environments. So um, bees are more likely to fan if tempers, temperatures are increasing quickly, but only in groups of 10. So this is the sneak peek I gave you a little bit earlier. Must have duplicated that slide by accident. Um, so they're more likely to fan um, and I didn't show you this data for the, uh, the groups of the single bees or the groups of three. This data is published um, in Animal Behavior, and I'm happy to send this paper if you want to dive into it a little bit more. Um, but in groups of 10, they're really good at queuing in on the environment. Not only are they behaving uh, differently in those groups, um, but they're fanning at lower temperatures when the temperatures are increasing quickly. Uh, essentially, I take this as they are um, anticipating temperature change. So they're saying, hey, this, our environment is changing really fast. The temperature is increasing very quickly. We need to take, we need to take action right now. We can't wait until this temperature is too high before um, uh, we can't actually affect any change. So I think that was really fascinating. It's one of my favorite papers um, that I published during um, kind of through the, throughout my entire career so far, but um, you know, especially during my PhD, I've had a really, um, really fun to collect that data and get that, um, those results. And then finally, um, how does the presence of larvae affect fanning behavior? So this is important, again, because if the uh, developing larvae inside the colony get too hot, they can develop these malformations, their learning behavior is affected, their development is affected, um, and they can die. So it's critical that the colony maintain a, a really uh, ideal temperature range around 36 degrees. Um, so um, oh, I already I dove into that already. So um, bee, we, again, we collected bees in, uh, from uh, the hive and we placed them into, um, the, into those little mesh cages and we placed them uh, by themselves. We placed them um, into a container um, uh, with larvae. So we placed them either by themselves. And then we had this little container where we could place the larvae into the, the mesh cage with the bee. Um, again, this is a single fanner bee. So this is just one bee uh, that was fanning at the entrance of the colony. Um, and then we had a little trap door where we could then either place the bee in with the with the uh, sorry the larvae in with the bee or place it uh, in a little trapdoor compartment underneath the bee so the bee um, in this case this uh, fanner was not able to interact with the larvae um, but she could still see it she could still sense pheromones if that's what the bee was doing um, uh, or if that if that if the larvae was emitting any pheromones um, but here the the bee could interact with uh, in you know with the larvae inside she could could interact with um, the bee. I don't know, actually, know if you could see my uh, um, cursor. Sorry about that. So this middle one, she could interact with the bee, uh, with the larvae, um, but in the uh, third one, she could not. So here I'm going to show you the probability of fanning. Um, we have found that, again, when bees are by themselves, there's no lar larvae present, they're just alone, they're really not likely to fan. So this is great. We did this over m multiple years and we kept getting this response. So it's always good to confirm your own results. Um, and then when the larvae was present and the uh, fanner could interact with the larva, um, the, the probability of fanning increased. So she was significantly more likely to begin to fan when she could interact with that larva. So what happens when the larva was present, but she could not actually interact with it? Uh, we see that probability drop. So again, uh, if that larva isn't actually physically present where the bee can interact with her, um, with the larva, then uh, we, we see that fanning probability drop. So um, to just summarize these results, um, bees are more likely to fan in the presence of a larva, even just one larva. So this is a, um, later stage in star right before they go, right before they pupate. Um, so kind of a bigger, chunkier larva. Um, so they're more likely to fan in the presence of a larva, um, but they need that direct contact. So I think this tells us a little bit about the importance of how the larvae may be potentially communicating with the adults, um, their needs, and their, especially when, when we're talking about thermal needs, and the, um, the, what the adults are queuing in on in the environment, especially when it's heating up and maybe that plays some kind of role in, um, 
in uh, how the bees respond. So my future work, I'm hoping to um, at some point uh, explore what cues bees could potentially be using from the larvae to know when to fan. Um, so that is um, a lot of my PhD work kind of in a nutshell. So it's fun to take about a half an hour to, you know, summarize things that took me five years to do, but uh, really fun work. And I'm really excited to get back into that uh, as, a, as a professor here at Marquette as I get my lab going. For my postdoc, I still studied honeybees, but I started, I ventured off into uh, foraging and cogn cognitive behavior. So that was pretty fun. All right. So now getting into the next part of my talk, um, now I wanna talk about what do honeybees do? How do they thermoregulate when it's cold? And kind of subsequently, how can we use this information about how they thermoregulate to keep better bees? And especially in the context of uh, a changing environment and how bees are going to be managing a changing environment. So um, again, this is kind of harkening back to uh, Celia's talk a couple of weeks ago, where I mentioned in the summertime, and, and you know Celia mentioned as well if you were able to catch that talk, but I'll, I'll uh, give you the brief overview here, um, that in the summer, bees live, the worker bees live about 40 days. So they're doing, they're going through nursing, these, the middle-aged task group, and then they end their life as a forager. Um, so they're really kind of, go, once they start foraging, they really just forage themselves to death. Uh, in the winter, however, those uh, workers can live to, uh, up to four months. So uh, October, November, December, into January, and even sometimes into February, depending on uh, how healthy the colony is. And so these worker lifespans can really be broadened with the reduction of foraging behavior. And that's really what we think um, kind of drives the senescence and the aging process that happen um, uh, in, in the uh, summer bees. So when uh, in the winter time bees, uh, and this is what my winters look like here in Wisconsin with snow and, um, and ice and just, you know, drastically changing temperatures every day. Um, for example, today it's it was 30 when I, uh, Fahrenheit, sorry, I know I'm so bad. So it was about 30 when I took my dog out a little while ago and tomorrow it's gonna be uh, in the 50s Fahrenheit. So um, yeah, great winter, wonderful. Lots, lots of temperature uh, fluctuations uh, here in the Midwest. Um, so in the winter time, bees are, what they do is they cluster together. They are, uh, they form these really tight um, balls depending on uh, what temperature it is outside. So they'll expand and contract as needed uh, as the temperature fluctuates. And what they do is they actually vibrate their wing muscles to shiver. So they are, they form these tight balls and the workers, the goal is to keep the queen warm. And so uh, at this point, at some point in the winter, the queen will stop laying eggs and she takes a break, which is also important for queen health. Um, and this is in contrast as well to um, what I saw in Arizona. So I did my, P my postdoc in Arizona and in Arizona, the queen often does not take a break from laying brood. And so uh, the queens in Arizona, we had to requeen at least once a year, often twice a year. Um, and this is just for research. So we weren't super concerned about honey production or anything like that. Um, but in those areas, I've even heard beekeepers replacing queens three or four times a year to keep honey production up. So uh, when queens don't take a break, they can really um, uh, fail a lot sooner. Um, so the, the workers at this point, when the, the queen stops laying, they're really just working to keep themselves warm and to keep the queen warm. So the queen will be at the center of that cluster. And you can see here this, um, uh, this uh, thermal image of uh, the cluster of one of these swarm clusters is that the colony, that the bees are very warm kind of at the center and then towards the periphery, they get a little bit cooler. And uh, there are several modeling papers that have come out uh, over the last uh, couple of decades where um, bees will actually, uh, they, they go into the middle and this whole, this cluster essentially is just a 
big old cluster of moving bees. So they'll get cold on the outside, they'll go to the center, then they'll warm up, and then they'll move on the outside. So all these bees are just constantly kind of flowing and, and um, interacting with each other. And again, I mean, there's so much work that we can do to understand what is it just temperature that they're queuing in on or is there some other communication that potentially happens uh, during this time as well very interesting stuff um we also um uh saw this in excuse me in some of the work that i've done um yes ben says kind of like penguins exactly yep so they cluster and then they move exactly so very like um i don't know if i want to go as far as to call it altruistic but very you know, thoughtful behavior <laughs> to keep everybody warm. Um, okay, so um, we did some of this work as well. We put sensors into our colony and uh, into a couple of colonies. And we also found that using sensors, so we have these temperature sensors that run across the top of the frame. So we had five going across the top of the frames. And then we also had five um, going into in between uh, the center of the frame. So we had 10 temperature sensors across. And here I'm just showing you data from three temperature sensors, the two on the outside and one in the center. Um, so this is a colony that we had in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, and so over re really around this time of year, so between October and January, um, this is a very healthy colony. Uh, number of frames of bees went from about 10 and a half to almost 13 frames of bees over winter. So a colony that actually grew over winter, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and we saw that bee, this, health, this colony that was very healthy, no mites, um, really maintained their temperature. Uh, and sorry, this is in Fahrenheit again, um, but they're really maintaining their temperature uh, very tightly in uh, the cluster. Um, and you can see exactly where they clustered right in the middle of that colony, right around that red temperature sensor. And then the outside temperature sensors um, were much cooler and they fluctuated uh, with outside temperature as well. So um, really interesting um, data that we were able to collect. So we use these sensors just to understand what the bees are doing inside the colony. Um, and this is important because um, we're putting we're, we're putting bees in different environments. We want to know what's going on inside the colony. So the question here that we, one of the big questions that we have in the United States is how are we going to be dealing with climate change? And especially when we have a massive honeybee agricultural system where, um, for example, in uh, at the end of January and early February, uh, millions of honeybee colonies will be shipped from across this country to California, to one central location to do almond pollination. Um, and it happens for better or for worse. Uh, there's a lot of us who probably wish it wouldn't happen, um, but it does. And we need, uh, we have a higher demand right now for pollination uh, than the honeybees in the United States provide. So um, we have some very serious uh, agricultural based issues that we're trying to figure out here in the United States. Uh, in addition to just dealing with uh, this massive congruence of uh, bees in California for pollination, we also need to think about what is going to happen across this country uh, with climate change. So if we just look at, um, you know, just about the past century, we have seen some really dramatic changes in certain areas of this country uh, that the uh, we're seeing temperatures um, uh, change even just within the last 100 years and warm in certain areas. Um, but other areas haven't seen this temperature change. So I think that with such a diverse, um, you know, biomes, with such diverse biomes in this country, um, we have beekeepers are facing very different situations depending on where they're, where they're beekeeping, where they're bringing their bees from. Um, and uh, this is something that we're, we're facing some serious issues with. And I'm focusing here on the US, but Ireland is also not, uh, not um, uh, getting off scot-free with climate change. So these are two models that I uh, found in uh, from a climate model um, published a couple of years ago. And uh, here's just on uh, figure A uh, on side A on the left side, um, just the, the potential uh, increases uh, per uh, temperature per degree Celsius that you might see across Ireland. Um, and uh, figure B, panel B on the right is the um, 
uh, more extreme version of that. So what temp the, you know, we're looking anywhere from between uh, 0.9 degrees Celsius to uh, maybe two degrees Celsius um, across the uh, uh, country. So really, I, it doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but I do wanna call your attention to um, the bottom uh, corners, the bottom right corners of both of these panels is that the fall time, the autumn uh, season is the most dramatic temperature change for both of these models. And I think this is really important to pay attention to because uh, we've seen some really serious issues with varroa mites, especially here in the US. And I know in Ireland, you're dealing with these as well. So population growth of varroa mites and what we're seeing happening is that populations of varroa mites absolutely skyrocket in the fall. And we think this happens because um, the varroa mite behavior changes. So they're, um, uh, they're, they're changing. So the varroa mite are switching from uh, being, uh, you know, looking for places to mate and to lay eggs like inside the cells to actually wanting to spread. And so they get onto foragers. There's also evidence that mites change the behavior of the bees that they, um, that the nurses actually start to forage earlier in their lives um, when they're infect infected, infested with um, more mites. And so we're seeing these really dramatic changes in the fall. And um, in addition to the, just the skyrocketing numbers of what happens in the fall, um, we're seeing issues with food availability. So we all know robbing happens in the fall. So the colonies start, uh, the bees start going into other colonies. And if they have lots of mites on them, which happens in the fall, uh, as they're robbing food, they will spread like wildfire through the colonies. And some more recent work um, that came out of uh, Dennis Van Engelsdorp's group um, in, at the University of Maryland also then shows that uh, varroa feeds on fat, on fat tissue uh, instead of hemolymph. So at first we thought that the mites were feeding on just the blood, the hemolymph um, of the bees, but we recently discovered that they're actually digesting the fat inside the bees. So when we think back to how do we how do we reconcile this information? So mites are skyrocketing during the fall. They're destroying the fat reserves that these colonies have built up. And in Celia's uh, talk, she really talks about the importance of food and the importance of building up stores inside the colony. But it's also really important to keep in mind that those stores are building up nutrition and, and um stores inside the bees, right? Inside the individuals themselves. So they're storing fat, they're storing protein, and they need that fat and protein to make it through the winter. And if the varroa is getting on them and skyrocketing in the fall, that really is the worst time for that to happen. And you see lots of winter failure, at least that's what we've seen in the United States. So one, uh, one solution that the United States has, um, has begun doing is building these massive cold storage units. So these are massive warehouses uh, in uh, California, Idaho, um, and South Dakota, where they uh, have these cooled um, warehouses, and some of them have been, uh, were potato or carrot storage units that are uh, are used for bees during the winter and they're used for potato and carrot storage during the summer. Um, so then they're transformed into these uh, temporary bee storage units and they are massive. As you can see, the semi truck is bringing in this load probably of at least 400 colonies into this massive warehouse and they stack them up floor to ceiling. Um, and uh, the colonies spend um, uh, several months in there, usually from November through uh, the end of January, where or, uh, middle of January, when they, the, they'll start to uh, bring the colonies to California for pollination. So when we think about this, um, the cost of getting these um, colonies into, um, 
uh, warehouses, you have to feed them, feed pollen and syrup um, to bulk them up, of course, as, as Celia mentioned, um, making sure that the colonies have enough food uh, to make it through the winter, um, just period. But especially if, you know, if you're going to spend all this money, then shipping them uh, to Idaho or California. So depending on where you are in the United States, shipping them across the country. And then the rental for overwintering ends up being about $208 per colony to overwinter. So you're talking pretty skyrocketing um, uh, cost to manage colonies over winter. Um, and right now in Ireland, the, 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 you know, these warehouses are keeping them uh, at about, um, so 40 degrees Fahrenheit, what is that, about five and a half degrees uh, Celsius? So that's what we, uh, these units are keeping the colonies at. Of course, with it being so large, it's difficult to manage the microenvironments. Again, we're talking about microenvironments and making sure that the temperature is equal, the CO2 is equal, the humidity is equal across all these colonies. Um, so they're seeing some issues with these massive units um, with uh, little pockets of CO2, not enough circulation, uh, humidity buildup, molds, uh, and other types of issues that the colonies can come out with. Um, so lots of issues here. So one, so this is kind of where um, some of my research comes into play. So um, my business partner and I, Kim, started a uh, company called High Tech Solutions. Um, and we first started out by putting sensors into colonies and just really trying to understand uh, how bees are thermoregulating and what they're doing inside the colony. So me from a uh, kind of biology and ecology and evolution perspective, Kim is a wonderful architect and also a professor at CU Boulder um, in Colorado, so University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and uh, so she, from an architectural standpoint, wanted to know what the colonies are doing, what the bees are doing, how they're interacting with the built environment. So um, we got together when I was doing my PhD and we're like, what's, let, we, we gotta be doing, this has to be better, right? We have to be keeping bees better, especially here in the US. Um, again, as I said, for better, for worse, um, some of the practices that um, we engage in for agriculture is not always perfect for bees. Um, so we then decided to build a more affordable, um, um, mobile climate controlled apiary. So this is our MICA, our mobile indoor climate controlled apiary. So this is a modular unit that we um, constructed with uh, the funding from the US Department of Agriculture. So very thankful for a small business research initiative grant um, to be able to do this. So this sits on a, a trailer and we're able to move them, um, uh, move the trailer to wherever the bees are and put the bees into cold storage. So this is just a small little schematic of it. So this is two modules. So each side holds um, 48 colonies, so we can hold up to 96 colonies in this entire thing. Um, and we have circulation, we can control the temperature, humidity, um, and CO2 inside the colonies by setting uh, different ventilation points uh, for um, for the unit itself. And then we also have big industrial cooling units um, that keep everything cold. And we are able to um, monitor this. So we have this connected to Wi-Fi. So we're able to actually monitor. I, this is a screenshot I took just this morning. Um, so we actually have bees inside this unit. We're collaborating with Brandon Hopkins um, at University of Washington, uh, sorry, Washington State University um, in Pullman, Washington State here in the US. Um, and we are able, we have colonies in right now. We have 30 colonies on one side and 28, 29 colonies on the other. Um, and we're able to manage the temperature perfectly uh, at around um, 40 degrees. So I think five and a half degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, it's working really well. The bees have been in for, uh, it'll be a month this week, which is crazy. So we're really excited. So um, what, we're, what we're hoping for, so the, the bees, we're not monitoring uh, we, we obviously aren't going in and checking on the bees right now, um, but we're essentially trying to figure out, uh, will our unit um, keep the bees healthier? So we uh, uh, inspected them and characterized all the colonies 
uh, before they went in. Um, but we did a small scale experiment a couple of years ago with our first prototype. And this is what the colony survival looked like. So the blue uh, um, were the colonies that went in. We had 11 colonies in, 12 colonies out. And at the end, we had one colony alive um, on the outside and uh, nine colonies alive, uh, I believe, nine or 10 colonies alive um, from inside the, inside the unit. So we're very, we're very hopeful um, about this unit as far as um, what it can do for bees, getting the bees out of the environment, getting them into a more stable um, environment, more thermally stable environment, um, uh, especially in the fall when the mites are spreading, uh, if we can get them out of the environment, put them into something more stable, it helps them retain their fat bodies, it helps them, it helps prevent the spread of mites, especially around that critical time of year. And we're seeing some pretty good colony survival because of this. So we're really excited about this. Um, of course, uh, you know, we have this product that we want to sell, but me on the academic side, I'm like, what? what's the physiology of this? And we're collaborating with the USDA to try to understand exactly what's going on inside these bees throughout the winter. Um, so and as you know, and uh, Celia also mentioned just the importance of um, mitigating a lot of the disease. And I think if we can mitigate the spread of mites in the fall, we can mitigate a lot of these diseases. And so the timing of this is uh, these bees will come out in January, mid-January and will characterize them, their mite loads, their um, viral loads, and the survival. So we're really excited and very hopeful. Um, if you're more interested, and if you're interested in some of this work um, and some of uh, our products, this is our website. Um, if you want to sign up for any information um, and keep in the loop about that, um, go ahead, uh, hypetechsolutions.com and check out our website, which we just got up and running. And I'm going to send out a newsletter this week um, so we're really excited about this, um, not only for um, our, my own research, but I think for bees in general, I think cold storage seems to be an option, a pretty good option for us uh, uh, beekeepers here in the US. Um, in addition to a lot of this work, again, of course, I am an academic. My full-time job is a, as a, my full-time paid position, I should say, because um, I work pretty much full-time for Hive Tech as well, um, is a, as a professor at Marquette uh, University here in Wisconsin. So um, this is a lot of the work that I'm focusing on, uh, of course, honeybee thermoregulation, so understanding the mechanisms, the genetics of uh, that really interested in the effects of social isolation, I think, especially in the context of the pandemic. Um, bees are very social and we know that social isolation negatively affects them as well. Um, so I'm very intrigued by that in terms of behavior. Um, I love, uh, I did my postdoc uh, focusing on learning and social behavior and I'd love to start looking at um, solitary and subsocial bees as well. Of course, I'm very interested in cold storage. So what's the effects of cold storage on behavior and learning and um, survival of colonies. And then I'm also very interested in, of course, all of this stuff interacting with uh, the microbes that live on and inside bees. So I have a couple of collaborators looking at viromes and microbiomes. So trying to do a lot. I don't know if I'll do any, all of this. I'm doing some of it at least. Hopefully soon um, we can get my lab going, um, but I'm really excited. So um, thanks so much for uh, sitting through this talk. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you found some of this interesting. And here is my contact information. So if you uh, want to shoot me email or uh, follow me on Twitter or um, check out my academic website or our business website. I'm super, super intrigued. Um, also, any feedback from this? If you're, you know, if you have done cold storage or you're curious about cold storage and just want to uh, have a conversation about it, we are always looking to uh, chat with beekeepers or academics about this work. So, um, really, any, any, anyone who wants to get in touch, I'd welcome it for sure. So, thank you all, and I'd love to take questions. Okay, we have a few questions. They're in the uh, Q and A box. If you all righty, sure. Okay, so it looks like Ben asked a question: Can U.S. bees use these methods to kill giant hornets that are now being uh, found in North America? And it looks like Wayne um, men uh, answered that question, looking that the Asian honeybee does ball up and use that thermoregulation. So they heat up, they surround that giant hornet. Um, 
and they can kill one of them like that, but they can't kill them in large numbers. But and that is something, of course, that is a very evolved trait. So when we, they the bees are using when their their defense is using the heating is you know like creating that bee ball and heating up that wasp, um, that hornet. Um, to kill it because that hornet can't be stung. The, the exoskeleton, uh, that cuticle is so thick that the bees can't sting it. Um, and so they use that, you know, their thermoregulatory powers, but that's the Asian honeybee and they have co-evolved with that Asian hornet for a very, for, you know, millions of years. So the uh, European honeybee does not seem to have that uh, defense. Although um, I have seen uh, European honeybees ball up and heat up a queen before to kill her. So she, they probably have that, you know, innate response, whether that they'll actually be able to use that against the hornet. That's a whole other question, I think. So really interesting. And the, you know, the question of evolved versus learned versus, you know, like uh, innate and I don't know, just beautiful questions. I think, I don't, I don't think we know the answer to that quite yet, but a very good question. Uh, ben, and thanks Wayne for popping in on that question as well. Um, okay, so Peter has, has a question. To what extent does an open mesh floor affect the ability of bees to thermoregulate? Um, that's a great question. Um, we have not done any work. We do have a, a pallet system that um, we have a mesh floor and uh, a solid floor that we are going to run some experiments on. Um, really good question. I at some point in the winter, especially, ventilation is the most important thing for those colonies. So just being able to circulate air. Um, I've had colonies die when um, I did not have a top ventilation hole and the snow, uh, we had a big snowfall and it covered the entrance of the colony and the water vapor built up and formed ice crystals on the bees and they died. So really unfortunate uh, situation. So ventilation is really important. I think the open mesh floor might be uh, usable in uh, areas where you don't have a lot of snowfall or don't experience super cold temperatures. So Ireland might actually be a good place to, uh, to have an open mesh floor um, for at least winter thermoregulation. Uh, in the summer, you definitely wanna give them an enclosed space to be able to control. Um, so if you have an open floor and the heat is just rising and they can't effectively form these uh, these air currents, um, then I think that could be a problem. So yeah, really good question. And it sounds like Wayne also had some uh, input there as well. Um, cool. So is this okay that I just go down the list? Yes. And yes. Okay, great. great. Um, all right. So Dave said, do you treat for Varroa before putting bees into storage? If so, what do you use and when? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is also one of the things that we are, um, you know, when we work with commercial beekeepers, one of the things that we talked about with them um, is that, um, you know, there's a lot of these tools, these sensors, and, and they're trying to figure out, trying to help beekeepers know when to treat. But in the United States, beekeepers are essentially treating constantly for mites, except during the honey flow. And so it's really hard to treat for mites and like have this you know, pointed treatment. The commercial beekeepers, or at least, are treating for mites essentially constantly. Um, so the best thing to do for Varroa is just use an integrated pest management system. So you just uh, rotate what you have. Um, I try to use uh, at least two, I try to use three um, different treatments um, throughout the year. Um, and rotate them. So I'll use oxalic acid. So you can do oxalic acid dribble or the um, uh, the uh, shop towels. So that's one common thing that we use is just dipping shop towels in oxalic acid and um, propylene glycol. And then um, use oxalic acid, formic acid. So Mitoway Quick Strips is the brand that we have here in the United States. So a brand, a version of formic acid. And then um, in the US, the U US Department of Agriculture and one of my close collaborators, uh, Gloria DeGrandi Hoffman, um, she developed a product called HopGuard, which is actually using the extracts of hops from beer to, um, to treat uh, mites. And that seems to be pretty effective. But the problem with any of these is that they, the mites will build up resistance so quickly. So you just have to find two or three things that you 
like that you're comfortable using that seems to work and you know test do the washes for your bees you know i don't know about once a month <laughs> i i'm i'm on the on the side of doing it more often than not um, and the washes are the way to do it. The sticky boards aren't as accurate. So do the washes, count your mites often and treat uh, when you go above three mites per 100 bees. Um, so those are my favorite. Those are the products I use and the products that I'm comfortable using. I don't know if any of those, I don't, do, do you guys have um, uh, restrictions or anything that's uh, yeah. not legal in Ireland? Yeah. Yeah, we have, yeah. So there, there are some approved things, but Oxalic acid is approved for a uh, max is approved. Yep. Um, and Apigard is very popular. Yes. Ap yep. Apigard. Exactly. So, yep. and that's, what is Apigard? I can't, I always forget what that is. Thymol. thymol. Yes, exactly. Yep. So we, yep. And I actually, I have thymol in, I think I have, uh, so, I think thymol, this tab that I plugged into uh, my colonies for winter right now. So I think that this, uh, little plastic tab that's impregnated with thymol. I stick that in all winter long for into my uh, my colonies. Yeah, so. other, another slight difference is that um, using an alcohol wash is quite rare here. Some oh, people, okay. Uh, most people use a sugar shake. Yeah, and the sugar shake is, be is better than the um, than the uh, sticky boards as well. So yeah, just getting, just trying to knock those mites off of those bees. But I mean, there have been, I had a friend who had a couple of colonies and he's like, there's no mites on my sticky board. It's great. I think my colony is free of mites. We did an, uh, we did an alcohol wash, 70% uh, ethanol wash. And he had 50 mites in a, on a quarter cup of bees, 50 mites. Like just so many, I was like, what, what have you been doing all summer? <laughs> like, come on. So yeah, I think that like killing mites and I think uh, Celia also mentioned this, like that is, mites just carry so many viruses and so many diseases. It's the number one thing you have to do is treat for mites. Yeah, if you're gonna keep bees, you gotta, you're the steward of them, you gotta do it. That's my opinion. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, so Christina asks, how important is top ventilation to thermoregulation? Um, and I know Christina well, so hey, Christina, thanks for the, the uh, question. Um, is it easier for bees to maintain a one-way upward airflow than, uh, in, than in and out of the entrance? So that's a great question. And that's something that we're also very interested in. Of course, Kim and I, Kim being the architect and me being the biologist, we're very interested in how um, the bees uh, use their built environment to create some of these air currents. So there was a great paper that came out. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Orit Peleg, and uh, her colleagues, I think this paper came out. Um, so uh, what is his name? Uh, Peters and um, I don't have the name off the top of my head, but there's a wonderful paper that came out that uh, came from an engineering lab uh, out of Harvard. And um, Jacob Peters, that's the first author's name. And he, uh, they actually had um, air, uh, airflow meters and uh, therm uh, temperature sensors across the entrance of the colony. And they characterized the airflow. So they did some computational fluid dynamics to understand the airflow in the colony. And they found that the, the side, the, the, so the bees will arrange themselves and fan at the sides of the entrance. And they'll, that will bring hot air out. And that, then that, uh, that suction, that kind of like air movement allows cool air to kind of go up through the center in between those two groups of bees. And that's something that anecdotally I've seen, but there are definitely times of the day or times of the year where the entire entrance, the entire front of the colony is just covered in fanners and the cues are just so strong to fan that it doesn't really matter what they're doing. They're just desperate to move air around. Um, so I think top ventilation in the winter is especially important, but I think that, you know, when we think about uh, how bees evolved and them just living in, in cavities. Um, you know, trees are probably denser than a lot of the Langstroth colonies that we're using anyways. Um, so depending on how they're selecting their nest site and all that stuff. But I mean, they're really just thermoregulating in a tiny hole in a notch in a tree, right? So to have these multiple areas, I don't know that that is critical. Um, it probably doesn't hurt, but 
that is a hypothesis that I think can be tested. And that's something that I'm definitely interested in looking at, trying to put some more sensors through the colony. Uh, if we can do, you know, I don't know, it's so hard to see inside the colony and, you know, observation colonies are not accurate. They're not great. So for like naturalness of the colony. So it's definitely hard to characterize fully what exactly is going on inside the colony without disturbing them too much. But yeah, so again, ventilation in the winter, I'd say top ventilation in the winter, absolutely critical. I think the jury is still out uh, as far as the summer and whether that's uh, important. Um, so cool, I have a couple more questions here. So Dave um, asks, excuse me, occasionally the bees need to go out and defecate. How do the bees in the storage manage? Do you think it will encourage nosema? It's a great question. Um, we put them in uh, in the beginning of November and then the plan is to let them out in, in the middle of January. Um, I know that on any, you know, any warm day bees will take the opportunity to defecate. We don't see bees needing to go out or going out regardless of temperature to defecate in the big cold storage units. So they'll stay in if it's if if it's dark and it's cold, they will stay in. Whether that um, encourages nosema, I don't think we know that yet. Um, just anecdotally, we don't see colonies um, with nosema problems at least coming out of cold storage. But of course, it's just anecdotal. We don't have exact numbers. That's absolutely something that we're gonna try to monitor as much as we can. And a lot of the cold storage studies that we're doing, we work with um, commercial beekeepers who like after they go into cold storage and come out of cold storage, the commercial beekeepers just take them, they do their splits, they're, you know, they don't, they don't keep track of our numbers anymore. So it's a little hard to do these longitudinal studies to see if they're gonna have issues later on. Um, but we don't think with them being in November, December, January, of just a little less than three months, we don't see a problem with defecation so far. That's okay. I think, think that's still new and the jury is still out on that. Good question though. Okay, Alan, in cold storage, do bees not suffer from not being able to take cleansing flights? So same question. Yes, exactly, Alan. Great question. Uh, similar to Dave's. Um, again, we're not 100% sure on that. So definitely something to, um, to keep in mind and to investigate further. Um, Mario asks, um, is there a cost to the bees for thermoregulation behavior? Is it ener energetically costly? That is such a good question and that's something that I'm really interested in. So I would love to, we know that foraging is energetically costly, right? Of course, we know that. Um, and fanning, they're not carrying their weight or the weight of the food that they're collecting, but they are fanning their wings and they're using their flight muscles. They're, they're more active than uh, just walking around the colony. So uh, we don't have exact numbers on that, but I do think that uh, there is a cost to thermoregulation behavior, um, not only just behaviorally as far as the workforce to the colony that goes to thermoregulation, but um, I think in terms of the energetics and like whether bees are, you know, more likely to die sooner or something because they've been fanners, we haven't characterized that yet, but that is such a good question, something I'm super interested in. So I would lo absolutely love to look at that and so and dive into that some more for sure. Great question, Mario. Um, okay, looks like we have a couple more questions. So Paul said, I found my bees to be concerned with maintaining humidity. Is this um, particular to our climate um, or have you observed any uh, similarities in your work? So yes, humidity, we, especially in cold storage, humidity has been the absolute bane of our existence. So the, the uh, cooling units, can deal with pretty much any temperature, but as soon as you stick humidity into the equation, our freezer units freeze up and they're, they're a major issue. So we did an experiment in Houston, Texas. So our freezer units weren't doing super great. They didn't perform very well. And the colonies um, had hive beetle issues and um, uh, the honey was fermenting. There's lots and lots of issues. So definitely some uh, humidity tends to be, um, Tends, tends to be uh, kind of the, a bigger issue uh, in terms of um, when you're trying to regulate temperature as well as humidity. So definitely I've observed that in, in our work and that's something that we try to manage in the units that we're developing. Um, 
we have active dehumidifiers. We have done most of our development and, ex and, uh, and on the ground actual work in Colorado and Western Washington, which are both more arid climates. So the next step in our development is definitely trying to understand humidity and trying to figure, figure that problem out for sure. So great question, Paul. And that's something, yeah. So the, the bees don't do great uh, in, in terms of humidity and the units don't do great in terms of humidity. So always trying to figure that out um, for sure. Thanks for the question, Paul. All right, um, I'm gonna take a sip of tea here. All right, a couple more questions, Dave. Um, I've read somewhere that varroa can be killed in the colony by increasing humidity and temperature. Can you comment on that? Um, I have read. I uh, um, I have read that uh, there are definitely ideal humidity ranges for the mites and uh, ideal temperature ranges. Um, I know that in terms of the evolution of the mite, so the uh, varroa mite is. Uh, Asian from Asia, and they evolved on Apis serena, who I believe that is an open nester. So they're just nesting on branches and they build their comb on branches. And their thermoregulation of their larvae is, has a much broader range um, than uh, European honeybees. So when Varroa made the jump to European honeybees, it's why they became so prolific is because the, the temperature at which they keep the brood is the perfect temperature for the mites to reproduce, right? So if you can mess with temperature without messing with development of the bee larvae, then great. But it's, I think it's really hard to heat um, uh, the colony and uh, kill Varroa with, without negatively impacting your colony. As far as cold temperatures go, I think that's one of the things that we are trying to do with cold storage as well. Um, when you force the queen to stop laying, the mites have nowhere to hide. And uh, so if there is a break in the brood cycle and there's no capped brood for the mites to hide in, it makes your miticides more effective um, and it potentially allows uh, the bees to interact with outside ideal temperatures to potentially impact the mites. So we think that cold storage could also be not only just like a more stable environment for bees and bee health, but also a way that we can impact um, mites. Um, one thing that we are looking at this winter and we're working with Brandon Hawkins, who I mentioned, um, we're collaborating with for this cold storage, he's interested in carbon dioxide as a potential miticide. And so um, bees, honeybees can withstand high miticide, uh, sorry, high CO2, but the mites can't. And there seems to be an interaction there with high CO2 um, uh, drying out the mites. That they, they think that's the mechanism, that something with the CO2 dries out the mites. So there could be some interaction with CO2 and humidity that's happening there. So anyways, long story, long, long drawn out answer to that question. There's a lot of interact, interacting factors, I think, that um, influence the prolificness of the mites. Um, so definitely something to think about. And um, uh, we're, we're actively at least collaborating with people um, to try to understand this. And uh, we think cold storage could be a way to, to take advantage of some of these situations as well. So uh, having cold storage, increasing CO2 in these enclosed environments, something like that to, to tamp back down those mites, um, I think could happen. So we're, we're excited to go down that route as well. A um, couple more questions. So Connor says bees lived in trees for years and they only had one hole in and out. Yep, and the, the air goes in and out the same hole. Exactly, Connor, and that's exactly what I was thinking. And um, so for ventilation, I think we need to be careful with you know giving bees totally open spaces because European honeybees are not, you know, they're not open nesters, they're cavity nesters. So we wanna make sure we give them the environment, enough of the environment that they evolved in, right? I mean, we've done a lot, even just restructuring and creating the Langstroth colonies and to, you know, these colonies that allow us to keep the bees better. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, trying to, to, to 
emulate their environment is important, their kind of evolved environment. Um, and then Nelda says, can you provide the information on where to find uh, Celia? I think Celia Davis's winter B talk on YouTube. I don't know. Um, yeah, so the easiest, <clears throat> the easiest way is to search for Fibka, F-I-B-K-A on yep. YouTube. And once you find our channel, you find the talk there. Yep. Yeah. And I, I, found, I found it pretty easily just searching for her. So it's Celia, right? Celia Davis. That's right. Yeah. Yep. C, uh, C, C, C E L I A. Yeah. Yep. And I actually might have it on hand. Actually, I don't. Sorry. But yeah. Um, yeah. Great. Her talk is so great. Oh my God. So much information. Really. I really enjoyed that. Thanks for putting these talks on YouTube too. They're so, so helpful and so yep. useful. Um, cool. So Christina um, just mentions here that Nosema is more of a summertime disease. One theory is that feeding sugar syrup decreases the need to poop. So almost no solids compared with honey. So that's really interesting. So that, yeah, that may be um, feeding sugar syrup may be a way of combating the um, need for bees to go out and do these massive cleansing flights. And I know, again, commercial beekeepers are typically feeding their bees um, uh, syrup. So um, I, you know, again, the strategy is going to vary depending on um, uh, what strategy you take on managing your colonies, whether it's to feed um, syrup and pollen patties or artificial pollen or um, just try to give them as much honey as possible. Um, yeah, lots of, it's so interesting. These are just so interesting. I love, I love these questions. This is great. Okay. Um, Dawn says, so when I take the roof off the hive to top up with fondant, how long does it take the bees to get the temperature back up again? That's a great question. Um, so my rule of thumb is I do not take the, um, the lid off of a colony. If it's, if it's below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm sorry, I just don't know if that is Celsius, I'm so bad. Um, but if it's low, if it's lower than 50 degrees, so what is that? I don't know, 10 degrees, eight oh, degrees? 50. No, it's more, probably oh, closer it? to 14 or so. 14, yeah. Um, I, I just don't, I, it, it, there's such a trade-off with them having food versus needing to get back into that cluster. So if you break cluster, it takes them quite a long time to get back, um, to not only just get temperature back up, but just to reform the cluster because they just get so thrown off. And especially, I mean, again, in Langstroth colonies that we have, they already have a hard time clustering because of the frames. And so if you break that cluster, they don't have much to hold on to. They're not, they're hanging on to each other. You've kind of split that up. So my best advice is like, don't try not to break the cluster as much as possible. And if you can feed uh, with a different method, like, you know, I, um, I don't, yeah, entrance feeders, you can feed entrance feeders, or if there's a way to fill them without opening and breaking the cluster, um, definitely try to do that. Um, good question though, Don. And that's again, I don't, I don't have like, um, I haven't studied this, so I don't have, that, that would be really fascinating to just stick a temperature sensor in there, let them build their cluster, watch their thermoregulation, break it, and then see how long it takes them to get back. That's a really great question. Something definitely to look into. Um, so Connor says he uses insulated roofs and open mesh floors and they're doing okay. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And Connor, I don't know where you are. Um, if you wanna just let me know where you are too and what the typical uh, environment and climate that you're working in. Um, but yeah, that's great. I think that that's a pretty interesting way of doing it. Um, and I know in Arizona, we we had a couple of colonies that we use mesh floor, mesh um, like open floor, mesh floor with as well, and they did pretty well. But that Arizona is very different than like where I am in Wisconsin, where it's like you know pretty cold and pretty warm, and then cold and warm, and yeah, poor bees. Um, Ten OC plus bees move out. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know what that means. Connor, I don't know what 10 OC plus bees move out means. I think so. perhaps he's saying a 10 degrees plus and centigrade. Oh, and that gotcha. Bees, that bees and the bees move. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. And so, Connor, you're in Ireland. Cool. Yeah. So, pretty stable. Yeah. And I honestly, like, just looking at um, your Ireland is 
so the temperatures are so stable and over the winter you 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 guys are right around the the temperature that uh we keep the the unit the cold storage units at so i mean you guys are essentially your own cold storage unit <laughs> over there <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty perfect but yeah so that's you know i think the um you know thinking about the future and uh potential um uh climate change issues you know that that's when we maybe have to just think about other options and right. in places like ireland but yeah i think it's really um really interesting oh christina mentions that tibor zabo years ago did studies in opening hives even in the summer it takes a day for them to get back to normal even uh just lifting the lid and replacing it wow thanks christina that's really interesting um yeah i think yeah the, there's the bees again they cre they create their little micro environments and they create their air flows and temperature gradients and they know how to do it so anytime we disturb them it can be tough for them to get back. So it's always the trade off of putting the mitocyte on, disturbing them, feeding them, disturbing them, taking honey out, disturbing them and letting them kind of do their own thing. So ugh, I know just such a balance. Um, and Susan also another suit, another vouch for um, mesh floors uh, and she's up in Northern Maine. So yeah, really cool temperatures up there. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, so do we want to wrap it up? I think I, Ben just asked one more question. Opinion on the flow hive. Super interesting design. I think it's a it's um, something for probably hobbyist beekeepers to interact with. I don't know the the um, you know feasibility, especially the cost is still, as far as I know, still pretty high. Um, so I think you know. I think for the, for the hobbyist is probably fine, but I know a lot of beekeepers, you know, commercial beekeepers or even uh, what we call sideliner beekeepers, some are like honey producers here in the US who just do it the old fashioned way, just putting frames in a centrifuges and spinning the honey out. <laughs> Pretty interesting, love the design, love the marketing of that, the flow hiring people, people just went nuts over it. It was great, so yeah, good for them. I, actually, I have one question before you go on. That sure. Is, that's uh, on the CO2. Um, yes. It's used as an anesthetic in, in instrumental in, insemination with the, you know, to knock out the queen. So if you've got a lot of CO2 in the hive, will, will that knock out all the bees? <laughs> that's a good question. So they can withstand really high CO2. So we have to, we use pure CO2 and it takes a couple of minutes, even with 100% CO2 to knock out the queen. So that is a really interesting question. Um, and I don't know if, so when we inseminate queens, we also, so we obviously use CO2 to knock them out and inseminate them. And then we get them uh, either the next day or a couple of days later and put them in high CO2 again. And that induces laying. So I don't know if any, if you've experienced this, Brendan, or if anyone mm -hmm. else have ex, have have done this. So I worked with a Turkish beekeeper, wonderful beekeeper, Jahid Ozturk, um, at Arizona State, and he we would always treat queens twice with CO two. And there's thought we were talking about like why do we do this? And he's like, I don't know, it just works. It gets the queens to lay. And I was like, well, there's got like what happens? Like why do we do this? And we came to the conclusion that it's probably associated with, with high CO2 in the cluster of drones that happens when they're doing their mating flight. And they're just, they're flying, they're producing a ton of CO2, they're, the, they're clustering around the queen and it increases CO2 then. Of course, we use it to knock her out, but CO2 works to induce uh, egg laying as well. So very interesting. CO2, I think, has some very interesting uh, implications um as far as yeah like what what like yeah how evolutionarily it like is used to answer your question though brennan i don't i they can withstand really high co2 um even when we're just knocking them out we use 100 percent, and it takes a couple of minutes um what i think the the levels that brandon hawkins has used is around eight percent uh, six to eight percent, and he sees no negative impacts um, or any issues with bees dying or fall, you know, falling down or any of that. Um, no disruption of clusters. So I think he's probably going to try to push it higher even and see the effects on mites 
um, and find out where that tipping point is. So I, I would say stay tuned to his research. Yep. Um, yeah, super, super interesting stuff. So he's definitely lots of cool stuff happening in Washington State with Brandon. Well, cool. This has been so much fun. Thank you all so much for your time and all the wonderful questions. Um, like I said, please get in touch with me, email, Twitter, uh, follow us on, uh, you know, join our, our um, listserv on our website if you're interested in what we're doing as a company. Um, but yeah, this, this has been such a pleasure. I really appreciate the invite and please, yeah, keep me in mind for future, <laughs> for future talks and, uh, and everything. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, of course. Really appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. Anytime. Such a pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.